when you treat people really well, they stay, they don't leave. And when they stay, they gain more expertise, they grow, they get better, the relationships get stronger. And these are all seeds for a very strong company and a profitable company as well. I, it's incredibly costly to lose someone and very difficult to replace them. Another way to have a profitable company is to offer incredible service. The relationships you have with your clients are absolutely essential. You treat your team really well. If the culture's fantastic, that seeps through to the clients. Clients can tell. They can feel that energy when they come into the office. They can tell when your team is treating them really well, when their team actually cares for them. And that's essential for profits as well. What's going on, everybody? My name is Ryan Snod. It rhymes with odd, and you're listening and watching the Rhymes with Odd podcast. Today, we are joined with Drew Harden. Drew, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Good to be here. Absolutely. So Drew and I were just trying to reminisce a little bit about um, where we knew each other um, prior to this. We have a couple of things in common, but um, just for people that don't know who you are and what you do, can you give us a rundown on who you are and what you do? Yeah. So I'm CEO and founder of Blue Compass, which is a digital marketing agency and uh, entrepreneur at heart, just like you are, which is really cool. I think we uh, share that. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I just spend each and every day with a group of really amazing, talented professionals, um, enhancing clients' online spaces, getting more conversions for their websites, and um, really focused on creating a wonderful, positive company culture that everyone loves and that enables us all to do our best work. Sure. Well, I'm really happy to have you on. I think there's a lot of stuff we'll cover today that'll be a fun topic to cover because um, you're in a similar industry, obviously marketing, but there's other other areas and avenues and stuff like that. So for people that don't know, like what is Blue Compass, your main business and, and what does it do and how are you guys different? Yeah, well, you know, most of the time when people ask me, I say, you know, Blue Compass is a place that will give your organization a clear direction for their digital presence. We spend each and every day getting more qualified users to come to our clients' websites and then getting them to convert on those websites, or in other words, complete the action that our clients want them to take. And we do that through web design and development and then digital marketing services. Search engine optimization, SEO is really big for us. We're very, very good at that. And so we spend a lot of time on that, but also do things like, you know, creating content, um, uh, doing online ads and things like that as well. Sure. So it's not just the the pretty, well-designed website, but it's something that actually is a tool. It's not a not just an ornament, but an instrument, right, for getting you somewhere. Absolutely. Both are important. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, someone wants a new website or sometimes people come to us say, hey, I'm ready to redesign my website. I want a new website. And that's great. You know, um, hopefully there'll be a great client that we can work with. But most of the time, organizations want to redesign their website because they haven't done it for a few years. And that's fine. And maybe they do need to redesign it. But we really like to look at the data and say, okay, what's not working? You know, why do you really want to redesign a website? Is it, uh, you know, maybe not just because the website doesn't look as nice as you want. That's part of it. But, you know, are you not getting the conversions that you want? Are people not reaching out to you? Are people not spending the proper amount of time on your page? What's working and what's not? And we like to diagnose that, figure out what the right direction is, and then help them move in that direction. So I think it's it's fun to kind of hear more about your business, but I think before we get too far in the weeds, I think it might benefit the listeners to hear a little bit about your backstory. So how did you kind of come to start a website marketing company and how did that whole process happen? Yep. Well, I was in, uh, I, I got an internship at a video production company when I was in college and I worked there for a few years as an intern and they hired me when I graduated. And I had an awesome job doing that. I was a designer and an animator, and I spent a lot of time, um, you know, working on um, TV commercials and videos and things like that. And I really enjoyed the time. They didn't do a lot of web work, but here and there they would do some web work. And I really enjoyed that. And as time went on, I realized, you know, this organization isn't going to ever embrace the web fully. They're very focused on video, which is just fine. But I was very interested in getting more into the web. And in addition to that, you know, the culture was absolutely fantastic when I started and I felt that change over time. And so I also really wanted to start a place that had a fantastic company culture that everyone just absolutely loved, where no one went home with gossip and drama on the mind and everyone had a great time. So 
I was really young. I was really just a couple years out of uh, college, and I didn't really know very much, Ryan, but I did know enough to realize that I didn't know a lot. And so I guess that was the one thing I had going for me. So one of the guys I worked with, his name was Kerry, uh, had a great relationship, and he actually worked in their web department. It was called New Media back then. And one day I just asked him, hey, would you ever be interested in starting our own place where we could just work on the web all the time? We'd always do digital. And he was like, no, my wife is pregnant with our first kid. You know, it's not a good idea. This is a good, stable job. Well, my wife was pregnant with our first kid at the time, too. And so I was like, yeah, I guess that's kind of a practical thing. Okay, that makes sense. So I let it sit for a while, but then I asked him again, and he said no, and I asked him again. I just kept asking him. So Mm -hmm. I'm persistent, at least. And uh, finally, you know, I think he had a bad day, Ryan, and he said, you know, let's do it. Let's do it. And so we ended up quitting our jobs. We didn't really have a big business plan. We had no funding. We had no backers. Um, We didn't have any clients or anything like that, but we just quit our jobs and we started Blue Compass. And it was just the two of us at first and we were just building websites. And, you know, we were really blessed and little by little, we were able to get some clients. We got some work. We were able to get an office eventually. So this is 2007. You know, as time went on, we got some more clients. We started to make a bit of a name. Um, We did good work. We worked really hard. And back then, Ryan, you know, we, we spent so many hours, you know, you're working 50 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours, 80 hours a week. It's really, it was really a big lift back then. And especially, you know, I had younger kids. Um, It took a lot of time. It was very difficult. But as time has gone on, you know, we've grown, we've been blessed. And now I've been able to hire people who are a lot better than me at doing all of this stuff. And I get to step out of the way and let the experts do their thing, um, which is wonderful. And uh, now I don't have to work 80 hour a week. So that's pretty nice. Uh, and so I'm thankful for that. So that's that's kind of the journey that I've went on along the way uh, in a nutshell. Sure. Well, how many how many years ago did you start Blue Compass? 16. OK. Mm-hmm. And you started obviously just you and Carrie. Where, where's the team now and how big of I mean, you guys probably aren't working out of a basement now or something. No. You probably have an <laughs> office space. So tell me a little bit about the growth uh, internally there. Yeah. I mean, so we've just slowly grown over the years. And so we have about three dozen people now, about 36 people. And, um, yeah, we have a a wonderful office. We work in person. It's one of the best ways to create an incredible company culture is to spend time together, is to bond together. And I mentioned that's so important for us. And, you know, our culture, Ryan, was always fantastic until about 2012. And I always say that's the best and the worst thing that happened to us because in 2012, we got an absolutely massive client, so much bigger than we'd ever gotten before. So that was great in that it helped us grow. It helped us um, develop new services. It was really good for us, helped us become more profitable. But it was bad because we grew too quickly. At that time, we had eight people. And um, overnight, we grew to about 16 people. And that was the first time I ever saw any types of drama or gossip creep into the company. And that was really difficult for me because that was absolutely something I never wanted to see. And I learned, Ryan, that the power of my personality isn't enough to fuel a great company culture, especially as you get bigger. Mm -hmm. We had to be very purposeful about setting, you know, the vision, the mission, the values, especially that we wanted to follow. So we developed values back then and we really follow them to that day. So our five values are we are positive. We support one another. We grow our expertise. We give clients our best and we reject reject drama and gossip. And I figured out that, you know, as a CEO, my number one role is to make our mission and our values known to our team, to live them out myself and to help our team do the same. And if I can do that, that really enables all of us to just have an incredible workspace to enjoy what we do, to go home with a smile on your face. Because, you know, company culture isn't a ping pong table. It's not just, you know, having beer on Fridays, but it's really the sum of the leadership and the values and the interactions that you have in the office every day. It's how you feel when you go home or log off at night. And uh, I think that's been really important in our success as well. For sure. Well, we'll definitely talk about culture a lot in this conversation because you actually wrote a book about having better culture in your your business. Um, So we'll talk about that. But I I think it's interesting as as an angle um, to look at your company because you, you, like you said, bad culture or poor culture is what led you to start your own company. Mm -hmm. So how did you put some of those like, barriers in place to make sure you didn't just repeat what happened where, you know, you went off, started your own company and just repeated all the same issues that would make other people want to leave in the future as well. Well, absolutely. 
I mentioned one of them, which is just defining the values, have visible values. And you can't just, I think it's so important for an organization to have values and they don't all have to be the same. Every organization is different. Every person you add on your team, you know, affects your, your culture so significantly. So I think it's all about adding the right people, just being very slow to hire, ensuring that the people you hire believe in those same company values. Okay. One of our values is we are positive. Do we really have someone who believes that, who, who wants to be positive, who wants to look at the bright side? I think that's really important. And so that's a big element of it. And um, so just being really plain and honest about all those values and I have to live them out myself and, and just having great leadership too. I think we have really good leaders at Blue Compass and I think a good leader takes a little more of the blame and a little less of the credit. And I think that's really important for us to do as well. So I think it comes down to values and leadership. For sure. Well, and finding, finding the right mix of people too. Cause like you said, you can, if you know, these are the values and then you're in a hiring situation and there's someone that's clearly very negative. They love the gossip. Their favorite thing to do is watch the, you know, the late night, um, I always call it trash TV. The, they just th- thrive off of the, yeah. you know, and that there's, that's what those people are fine. But if those aren't a good fit for your organization, yep. you can screen that right away and yep. get that out of your, out of your pl- workplace. Cause I've also noticed too, my wife recently left to do her own business full time mm. and there were contributing reasons with her culture at her workplace as well. And it's funny because when there's not clear, clearly defined values or who we are and people are left to their own devices, there's a couple bigger personalities that will decide the culture. I feel like it's like the, you know, they always say, um, Oh, what's the Simon Sinek thing. He's like, show me the highest performer and I'll show you the biggest, um, whatever. And we can believe <laughs> that. But, uh, it's funny. Cause it's like, okay, if you're, if your personality of your entire company is led by like this big personality of someone that's a high performer, that's also kind of cocky or arrogant or overly confident and everyone else on the team isn't that way. It can kind of bleed uh, badly in that. In your opinion, how do you help kind of keep and retain those people that fit the the narrative of what you want to have as a company so you can avoid some of those negative aspects of culture? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, if you can give someone a great experience where they are able to grow and thrive, where they feel supported, where they don't feel like they have to look over their shoulder because someone else is going to take their credit. And they can generally just have a great experience every day. I mean, that that is so important because, again, culture just isn't just a ping pong table. It's what we experience. It's every moment of every day. So, you know, people really value experiences. Benefits are important. Salary is important, obviously very important. But the experience that someone has every day is absolutely critical as well. And so if you can give someone a really good experience every day. And then another thing we really emphasize is just fun. We want to be a place where people enjoy going to work. Um, I, my goal in life is that everyone, you know, works at a place that, uh, you know, where Fridays and and Mondays are the same type of day. I mean, um, where everyone loves Mondays. And so if you can create a a place that people can feel joy, we do a lot of surprises. We'll do a lot of, of, of games and we really spend a lot of time trying to focus on our team internally and not just focus on clients, not just focus on profits. Those things are very important too. But I think if you focus on the team first, the, those two things will take care of themselves. Sure. For, for people that think culture is kind of woo-woo and it's like not that important, just focus on the bottom line. How has taking these steps in your company culture improved your guys' bottom or top line and bottom line? Like how has that actually turned into tangible results for mm-hmm. the business? When you treat people really well, they stay. They don't leave. And when they stay, they gain more expertise. They grow. They get better. The relationships get stronger. And these are all seeds for a very strong company and a profitable company as well. I, it's incredibly costly to lose someone and very difficult to replace them. So just retaining people is one of the ingredients to having a much more profitable company. Another way to have a profitable company is to offer incredible service. The relationships you have with your clients are absolutely essential. So if you treat your team really well, If the culture is fantastic, that seeps through to the clients. Clients can tell. They can feel that energy when they come into the office. They can tell when your team is treating them really well, when their team actually cares for them. And that's essential for profits as well. Absolutely. When I think finding finding those people and then keeping them, like you said, retaining them is really the hard part. But then 
you talk to most people, even even in jobs they don't enjoy. Like I've had plenty of jobs when I was in college that were not the most enjoyable. Sure. But you have people that are like, then they're at 25, 30, 40 years. And it's like, why, why are you here? Mm. Every person says the same thing. It's the people. It's never, I mean, the work is enjoyable mm-hmm. to some people, but it's almost always the people, yep. the relationships you have and those types of things. What are some uh, kind of fun ways that you try to encourage the the people connections at your guys' business? Um, so I don't know if you've seen the movie Top Gun Maverick, which came out, you know, a year or two ago. Um, there's a scene from it where, you know, Maverick is trying to train these pilots. They have like a week to go before the big mission. Millions of lives are at stake. And he stops the training and he takes them out to a beach and they play football together. And they're laughing, having a good time. And Maverick's superior officer comes up and says, hey, what are you doing? You know, the mission is just a week away. And Maverick says, you wanted a team. Here's your team. So when you have fun together, you bond. And bonding is one of the best ways to create relationships. And a team that likes each other, that appreciates each other, that has good relationships is absolutely essential. And when you have that, I mean, you look at a sports team, it's the same way. You have one star who's a jerk that, you know, no one else likes that doesn't work too well. But when you have a team of people who care about each other, who are willing to go out of their way to help another person, you know, at Blue Compass, if someone is working past five, you know, every single time someone else will, someone else will come up and say, hey, can I help you? Can I give you a hand? We have an organization where departments aren't pitted against each other, where people are happy and willing to give credit to others, where people don't have to stand up and say, I did this, this was me, give me attention. And when you create an organization in an environment like that, you can really do amazing things. That's a great uh, piece to think about too, because as, as any company grows, like I know for myself, I'm, I'm an owner operator, but in the next year plan to have like part-time employee and kind of start building my team. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to think, because it's like, I don't, thinking what, what would my, what do I want my company culture to be? Mm -hmm. What, when you're at the drawing table with your values and trying to figure those things out, when you went to build your own values out, what was kind of the, the process of elimination to build those things out? So it's not just the cookie cutter from every other company. It's like, you know, we just do this and do this, but it's like, how do you find the things that fit for what you want to build? Every company has values, whether they've set them or not, they'll, you, they will be set for you automatically, whether you set them or not. So you have to set your values. And that's, I mean, we never set any values when we started out. We we're really small. It's not quite as essential when you're super small. But like I said, I mean, if you're a really small organization, you can probably have good culture if you would just work at it, you know, really hard to treat people well. But as you get bigger, you have to define it. You can't hit a target that you can't see. So I think it's important to, when you set your values, and in my book, I write about this, but when you set your values, you know, set some values based around what makes you unique. Um, Maybe, you know, positivity was a big one for us that I mentioned. Supporting one another was a big one. Um, Expertise is a big one for us too. We grow our expertise because, I mean, we're in the digital marketing space. Google's algorithms are changing all the time and we have to keep up with that. That's essential for our clients and growing and getting better is one of our values. So, Focus them on what makes you unique, but I think also focus them aspirationally on where you want to go. And that's, that's how we did it. It's don't just, you know, don't just go to some other website and choose theirs. I think they need to be unique to your organization and focus them too. you know, what type of people do you want to have here? Those five values that we have at Blue Compass aren't just for Blue Compass. They're for every individual there. So what are three or four or five you know, values that you want everyone to have, or at least to aspire to. Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting because you, so you went through this journey with your own culture and then at what point did you decide I'm going to write a book about this and help other people? Uh, (laughs) Good question. Well, I've written, it's the second book I've written and, um, I started writing it, gosh, probably two or three years ago. Um, and maybe two years ago, it launched this year and, I had just, I've been asked more and more. I mean, I guess as time has gone on, you know, the word has gotten out about our culture. We've won national awards for it. And I I started to be interviewed about it. And people had asked me to give speeches on it and things like that. So I started (laughs) articulating it so much. I'm like, I might as well write some of this down, I guess. And so that's where the book came from. That's awesome. I know we've had a couple other published authors on. um, A couple weeks ago, it was Ben McDougall. And he actually went through the process of like, starting his own publishing company because he was looking mm. at 
publishers versus self-publishing or Amazon or whatever options, what option did you end up picking and, and what kind of steer, steered that decision for you? Yeah, I self-published and I did it through Amazon and they have a uh, platform with which you can do it. So that's the route I went. So you can obviously buy it on Amazon, but there's also some other outlets you can get it on. And then there's um, also an audiobook, and you can get that, you know, on Apple Books or Kindle or uh, Kindle Audio or Audible or anything like that. That's really cool. We'll make sure we put a link to the book uh, down below to check it out if you're trying to build better culture for your team and maybe future team or whatever your situation is. But um, I wanted to kind of switch um, back to a little bit more of the culture, but we'll, the last- I derailed us, sorry. No, no, it's fine. That's fine. (laughs) Um, A a question that I wanted to ask, kind of wrapping up that culture bit, especially in the current day, is with the work from home situation. Obviously, COVID's changed everything for how business is done and people thinking, looking at remote teams and all this stuff. For a more heavily remote or hybrid workforce, what is your recommendation mm-hmm. to build a, a thriving culture? Because I think a lot of people that are, if they're home 24 seven and they never are in the office or have any interaction, they might feel disconnected or like there isn't a culture. Mm-hmm. Company culture from creating company culture with uh, employees that work at home is more difficult. And the reason is, you know, if you're working from your kitchen table, the culture that you experience at one organization is very similar from the culture you experience at another organization. I mean, you have the same setting, the same experience every day in many ways. So it's very difficult. I think the key is, first of all, communication. I mean, communication is so important. Constant connection is so important between uh, team members and with your manager, but it has to be even stronger if you work from home. My wife works from home and she works at a large agency based out of Boston. She has for many years. And, you know, she manages people and she spends so much time doing one on ones. She has a one on one with everyone who reports to her, which is a lot every week. And I mean, sometimes she'll spend, you know, two hours with someone who's maybe struggling and going through something. She spends so much time doing this. And it's because she's a good leader. She listens and she wants to know what's going on. And this allows her to communicate with them, too. So just communication is so important. I mean, she'll send them uh, a gift card in the mail. She'll send them. Um, a letter, a card, something. I mean, she's always connecting with them. So just the connection piece, I think, is so vitally important. Um, that's probably the number one thing that you have to do, um, first of all, when it, you have a remote team. Absolutely. And, and finding those things, I've noticed the, not- like recognizing and acknowledging where people are at with their struggles that are going, you know, whether it's, hey, I know you're having a hard week or mm-hmm. I know you're, all your kids have been sick and you've been, you know, or you had a family member that uh, passed away or something like those little things go so far to kind of keep those things top of mind. Do you do anything at, at Blue Compass for that to kind of keep like people's birthdays or other yeah. like things to kind of make them feel yep. special without having to be like, hey, look at me. You know, they can feel <laughs> they can feel acknowledged that way. Absolutely. We do. And acknowledging people, appreciative acknowledgement is so vitally important. And one of the ways that we do this is first, there's really two elements to this, I think, Ryan. If you want to acknowledge people, if you want to acknowledge your team members, there's two elements we found that are really, really helpful. Um, Uniqueness and surprise. So surprise is the first one. You know, when, when someone is surprised, it heightens the experience and the emotions of whatever they experience, whether for good or for bad. It depends on the experience. And I know a lot of people say they don't like to be surprised, but I'm a big believer in surprising people. And so when we do something positive for our team members, it's always a surprise. Don't tell them ahead of time, and almost always at least. If I'm going to bring someone a coffee in the morning, I will never tell them it's coming. And the reason is, you know, if I say, oh, I'm going to bring you a coffee or whatever, then they anticipate it. They know it's coming. Um, it's, I don't believe it uh, surprises and delights them nearly as much. You know, if someone says to you, hey, I'm going to bring you a pizza tonight, you'll think, wow, what type of pizza is it going to be? You know, I hope it has pepperoni on it. But if someone just shows up to you and gives you a pizza as a surprise, even if it's a kind you don't like, you probably appreciate it more. So that's the mentality that we have. We'll do a lot of things for our team members, and usually it's kind of a surprise. So that's one of the ways we do it. And, and another way is just differentiate uniqueness, individualization. Um, on Employee Appreciation Day last year, uh, what we did is we went through and we made a gift box for every single team member. And each one had their favorite 
candy in it, their favorite snack, and it had a, uh, a card written specifically to them. We had a, a gift, like we bought a, an individual gift for each person, had a few other things, but they were all absolutely individualized. And individualized acknowledgement is much more powerful than universal acknowledgement. And another thing is, too, you know, there's um, a, a book called The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Office. Everyone likes to be appreciated in a different way. You know, I might come up to you and say, Ryan, your podcast is amazing. Like, you've done such a great work on it. And that means a lot to you. Whereas if I say that to someone else, I compliment them verbally. They might like it, but it doesn't mean as much to them. Whereas if I give them a gift, that's very meaningful to them. But to you, it doesn't mean quite as much. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do at Blue Compass is we try to understand how every single person likes to be acknowledged. And we do that, you know, when we hire them, we have them fill out a form and we just say, hey, what's your, how do you like to be acknowledged? I mean, we just ask them, um, do you appreciate this? Do you appreciate that? What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite coffee? What's your favorite restaurant? All these different questions. And then we have all that information in our intranet. So anyone can go click on anyone else oh. and they can see everything that they like. And again, because that individualization is so important. Because there's not like a gatekeeper of like, uh, Betty over here knows everyone's favorites. So then it's like obvious if you go and talk, it's like, oh, that it's more like anyone can grab it, which is yeah. super helpful. Yeah. Well, I think that's interesting because the the small pieces of that, like you said, that personal touch, I think, is the big thing that makes a difference with anything. It's internal company culture. If it's um, following up with customers or clients to make them feel special. I'm always interested in that because I know this time of year around the holidays, I, I ask a lot of people like, how do you, what do you do for clients? Do you like mm. send them a card, a handwritten note? Is it a gift card? Is it um, other things like that? Do you guys do anything special for your clients to kind of make that culture extend outside of the four walls of your guys' business? Yeah, we'll do client gifts and things like that. I think that's important as well. Um, another thing is just simply um, writing cards to clients and that's kind of a lost art, but I just sent out a lot of them this week, just individually thanking them for working with us. I think that's important. Um, you know, meeting with them individually in person and not necessarily talking about work, like having coffee with them and things like that. I think that's really important too. The quality of relationship that you give a client is just as important as the quality of service. It's really essential. So knowing that client individually, you know, knowing who their kids are, knowing what their hobbies are, knowing that they went skiing in Colorado last week, like those things are really important. Absolutely. Well, I, I just think of like one of my clients, um, when I was on a shoot with them, they were kind of distant uh, a couple weeks ago and it was because their mom was in the hospital. Mm. And it's like, every time I see her, I'm like, How, how's your mom doing? Like, and, mm. and genuinely caring, not just being like, oh, it's the first five minutes of a meeting. I should probably say something other than work relation. It's like those things I think make the big yeah, difference. That means a know? lot. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, this is, it's not rocket science, I suppose, but it's so easy to not do. It's kind of easy to do, but it's also easy to not do. It's important. Right. And it's like, well, this 30 minute meeting is to do, to talk about ABC projects. So we can't do anything else besides do those things. You know, I think that kind of helps like encourage the the human element of what it means to be an employee or a business owner yeah. or whatnot too. Yeah. That's cool. So switching gears out of culture, talking more about marketing. Um, obviously you guys work with businesses big and small um, for the business owner that's listening to this. Um, what advice do you have for them to really set themselves apart um, from other people in the, their industry when it comes to being present online or being accessible online? Is it website, social media? What would, what would you encourage people to do if they own a small business and they're trying to be seen online? Yeah. Um, it's, it's representing yourself online consistently with, with who you are and allowing people to find you and producing high quality content that's of value to them. It's not bragging, we're the best, we're the best all the time, but it's providing them with answers and value. Um, and I think that's kind of the basis of it. So one of the ways to do that, you know, Ryan, is just to have a fantastic website. It should be loading quickly. It should be attractive. It should be easy to navigate. Things are easy to find. And it should, like I said, I think that content marketing approach is so important. Ads are important too, and they have their place. But I love the idea, and this is something we've done for clients for years of, you know, put, putting a really high quality article or video out there that gives away your expertise. It's a great way to, you know, prove you're the experts, not just claim you're the experts. So give away some of that expertise. And sometimes people are afraid that, you know, 
my competitors are going to see it. Or, you know, if my clients see how to do my service, they won't need me anymore. But I've found that, you know, a good mantra of online marketing is the more you give, the more you get. And that's probably a good mantra of life in general. Right. right. And, and I think it, it really builds trust. It adds value and it will keep people coming back to your website. So just having a great website, you know, updating it, putting great content out there, representing yourself well, being honest. And, but then also, I think that search engine optimization piece is so essential. You know, if it's so powerful, if you can be the answer to someone's query, um, whether it's on Google or elsewhere, that's really, really powerful. And, and social media is important too, but people's intent is different on social media. You know, generally, most people don't do um, a lot of, you know, looking for probably your product or service. Usually people aren't going to social media, you know, to uh, buy something. Usually they're going there to have fun or to connect with family and friends or something like that. So again, if you can be the, the answer to your target audience's query, that's really powerful. I totally agree with that. One, like you said, user behavior is so unique because I know a lot of, um, I know a couple of different clients of mine that have like large TikTok following, for example. Mm-hmm. It doesn't convert nearly as much as YouTube because TikTok, you're just mindlessly scrolling. Mm-hmm. I couldn't sleep last night at 2.30 in the morning. I'm just scrolling TikToks. I'm like, make my eye, eyes tired. I don't want to, you know, I'm not looking to buy something. If I go to YouTube and I type in best um, lift desk for back pain, that's a very high purchasing intent search. You know, yep. I'm looking for that. Yep. So I think that's the really interesting thing too, is like meeting people where they're at because I have, I think like 16,000 subscribers on YouTube and people are like, oh, that's a pretty good chunk. I'm like, you don't understand like, the amount of those people that have be, like bought my courses, that have downloaded my eBooks, that have joined my email list, that um, joined my Facebook group. Now my Facebook group has like ninety five thousand people in it. It's like all from YouTube because the search intent is so clear. But then other other people I talk to, like they don't have a portfolio for their business if they design websites or shoot videos because they just have an Instagram page and they think, well, Instagram's adequate. And it's like no, because the average person is not going to go to Instagram to go find you. Like they're yeah. going to go to Google They're That's if you don't even have a Google, my business page, like, what are you doing out here? You know? So I think just kind of, like you said, meeting people where they're at is, is, is really important there. Yeah. And understanding your target audience and understanding where they're at. Absolutely. Well, and as, as kind of people just like kind of think of their marketing, I know we talked about kind of knowing, knowing your story and like putting out content that illustrates the story. So if people ask you like, what, what makes Blue Compass unique or stand out or what's kind of your guys' story? What's kind of your like two minute elevator pitch that you tell people? Or do you have to uh, tell this to yourself every morning when you brush your teeth to keep it in your head? <laughs> well, I think quite simply, if someone asks what sets you guys apart, there's three things that I say. And the first one is expertise. When it comes to digital, we believe we have the very best experts around. We know SEO. We know search engine optimization. We know Google. We know you know, Facebook algorithms, all these things, um, we know it really, really well. Our experts are just second to none. So the expertise when it comes to digital is one of the things that sets us apart. The second one is relationship. Like I said, we really believe the quality of relationship is just important as the quality of service. We're really good listeners. And if so, you know, if someone wants to work with a, a an agency that really listens and really cares, we're a good fit. And then the third one, Ryan, is just culture. And again, that seems like an internal thing, but that bleeds through to the client and clients tell us all the time, man, I love your culture. I can tell you have a good culture. So those are the three things that set us apart. I know there was a post I saw on your LinkedIn that I wanted to bring up, which was um, you talking about how the way you guys actually design your business structure and the format helps can like helps add to that culture to make it more desirable from an agency point of view. So for people that are listening that don't understand agency, you mentioned like if you get a huge client. And you have to hire on a bunch yeah. of people last minute yeah. and then say the client lays you off. Mm-hmm. And now you have to lay off all your employees on that team. Talk to me about how you kind of structured your business to help avoid some of those super highs and super lows and yeah. to avoid some of that turnover internally to make people feel like their job is a lot more secure than somebody that's in a different situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's fascinating the way you like sure, it, articulate you. that because as somebody that's in the industry, I'm like, that's really smart to do that to help again, retain people and help yeah. keep them around longer. Well, so many agencies out there, especially big traditional agencies, do layoffs all the time. And I'm, I'm very aware of, of a lot of organizations that do that. And I never want to have to do layoffs. Like we put our team first. We care so much about our team. So how can we not have to do lay? I mean, maybe it's inevitable at some point, you know, maybe. But I, I think it's used. That's something that's used way too often 
by so many huge corporations to solve a problem. And it's like, you know, if you didn't need all those people, why were they on the team in the first place? I understand sometimes you lose business, but the reason agencies do layoffs so often is because they have massive clients that make up such a huge percentage of their business that cut back or leave. Around town here, there's big agencies that have a client that makes up 40% of their business or more. That's way too high. So years ago, we were similar. I mean, we had a client that was probably about 40%, 50% of our business years ago. And we realized, man, that's dangerous because what happens if they leave or what happens if they scale back? So we worked really, really hard, Ryan, over the years to remedy that. And today, um, I believe last quarter, our number one client, our biggest client was 5.6% uh, of our uh, percentage of our revenue. So we're really proud of that. And that's really healthy. If the worst case scenario happened and they scale back or left, no one gets laid off, you know? And we've, we've diversified the client base so much that um, it's, it's, it's just really, really healthy. And we, we feel really proud about that. And in addition to that, you know, one of the things we do too is we don't specialize in one industry. Um, we work, I mean, primarily probably in financial industry, healthcare industry are most of our clients, but we really have clients from like almost every industry. And one of the reasons we do that is one, it's interesting. We, I think we probably learn more. Sometimes we can take some of the things we learn in one industry and apply it to the other. But also, industries are always having ups and downs. And if we just built websites and did digital marketing in the banking industry, then right now we'd probably be hurting. And so that kind of helps protect our, our employees as well. Well, and if you just, I always say, if you really niche down in one industry, it can kind of hurt you because then say you're doing something really well for this hospital and then another hospital wants to do it, but they're in a like slightly yep. different angle or it doesn't work for them. Then it's like, well, we're a one trick pony. We've got one thing we do for everyone, you mm -hmm. know, something that's kind of interesting. And it's also cool because in, in my line of work as well, I, I would similarly have probably 50 to 75 clients a year. So it's not like one huge client. And then if you lose them, oh gosh, like where are we going to get our money? It's like, no, there's other people, you know, if, you, if I feel like, and you can spread the joy a little bit more, right? You can help more people. It's not mm -hmm. just like, oh, we just do this for one company or one client. And like, it helps to kind of diversify it. Cause then, yeah. like you said, if, if you need to scale back or they need to scale back, it's not as big of a rub as like one of the huge agencies in town where if they lost one of their big clients, they'd have to fire like 50 people. Like that's crazy. And then yeah. you have a, a follow-up meeting, you kind of make, make face and like, oh, never mind. We're just getting like, well, let me go tell all 50 yeah. of our employees <laughs> that they can have their jobs back now. It's like, that would, like you said, that would lead to really toxic culture, I would think, because it's like jobs are supposed to be yeah. considered stabilized and, you know, within reason, like no, there's nothing's guaranteed in life, but that's supposed to be a piece of it that helps people want to stay, stick around. So mm. that's, that's always cool to, to hear how you do that. Yeah. Thank you. There are a lot, I mean, there are a lot of places out there, like when, when are the next layoffs coming? There's, you know, rumors like, because there's some, you know, some corporations, it's, it seems like every month, every quarter they're laying people off. So it's wonderful. It's a blessing to avoid that. Absolutely. Well, I think um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about was you, it's not just you at the top. You have a business partner with Carrie. You mentioned you guys started the company together. Talk to me about what it's like having a partner and kind of the, how you guys have outlined the roles within the company. Because I know a lot of times if you get two people that are very similar that want to do the same thing, mm -hmm. um, you do the same thing. You're doubling up on work. You, I cut payroll and then the other person does it too. It's like, well, now we just double paid. Like, what are we doing? So how do you, how do you iron out the roles within the business on the executive level? And how do you guys work as a team together? Great question. Most partnerships don't work very well. So if you're looking to start a business and you're thinking about having a partner, it's probably best not to because egos get in the way. There can be confusion. There can be conflicts. It can be very difficult. You got to have a really healthy relationship. So it's really almost like a marriage relationship in that it requires communication. It requires, you know, love and support. I mean, it's, it's very important. And, you know, Carrie and I have a wonderful relationship and I feel really, really thankful for him. And, you know, one of the things I love about Carrie is he doesn't have an ego. He, he wants Blue Compass to do well. He wants me to do well. And I want him to do well and Blue Compass to do well. So he, he's just a really wonderful guy. And, you know, our talents lie in slightly different places. And over the years, I've gravitated a little more towards, you know, the culture piece and more of the, um, you know, leadership piece, whereas he's gravitated a little more. 
he does a lot of leadership too, but he gravitates a little more towards like the finances and things like that. I was a designer initially. He was a little more of the developer. So we've been able to identify some places, you know, where our talents lie. And that's so important, you know, especially as you grow in your career, as you, you grow in your role, for you to be able to identify, you know, what you're doing that you should be doing and what you're doing that you shouldn't be doing is vitally important. What are you really good at that you're doing? What are you not so good at that you're doing? And we're all probably doing some things we're not so great at. So being able to identify those things is important. And uh, so I've just been blessed with Kerry. He's fantastic. And it's just all about communication, uh, about listening and you know supporting the other person. Well, I know I've talked with other people that have um, business partners and it's a similar thing. That, that I, What's the line? Uh, Dave Ramsey always says, I, the only ship that's be guaranteed to sink is a partnership. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Something like that. But I think if you're aligned well, it, it's just like a, a marital spouse. Like you said, if mm-hmm. you're... Like for me, people always like my wife and I've been together for 12 years since high school and everyone's like, oh, how does, how do you even get to that point? And I always tell people, I'm like, once you align where you want to be in life and you guys are like unified in that goal or the vision, you can't stop it. And it's like the same thing with business. It's like, as long as you and Carrie have a similar vision, common view of like where you want to take the company and you just take your unique talents and you get there together. It's like, that's, that's, I think that's like the best route to go. Cause I feel like the problems that arise are when someone wants to deviate or like, no, we should sell it to this person or I want to, I want to move here and do this. Like if you're aligned with what you want to do, you can't be stopped. It's like you can walk in step and two, yep. two gets you further than one. So, yep. Yep. That's so true. And you know, whether it's your partnership or your leadership team or whoever it is also, I think if you can have a, have the relationship and the rapport with people where you can disagree with one another, but you know that it's not going to ruin any relationships. It's not going to hurt egos, you know, disagreeing and uh, on things can be so healthy. So if you can do that in a healthy manner, it's really powerful. For sure. I know as we're kind of wrapping things up here, I wanted to talk about goals that you guys have for Blue Compass in the next, you know, five, 10 years, whatever the, the long, bigger picture goal is. What's kind of the pie in the sky for you guys as you continue to build the team out and grow the business? Well, number one thing, you know, um, just as one of our values is we continue to grow our expertise, we want to keep growing. I think as an individual or as an organization, if you're like, you know, I feel pretty good, I'm going to stay here, then you'll just fall backwards. So we want to grow. We want to, um, you know, have better services. We want to add to our services. We want to grow our departments so that we can be a larger blessing to our clients and to our team. I do think that that's really important. So Everything we do, I mean, we're expanding our development team a bit as we move into the next year, um, expanding our capabilities there. Uh, we'll grow our our um, design department as well. Um, I'd love for us to grow more into video and be able to offer more more of that there to our clients as well. Um, our digital marketing team is always growing. And so as we continue to do that, I think that's important too. So for us, it's just all about, you know, getting better at everything we do. I think that's incredibly important. And we'd love to, um, you know, we'd love to be more visible to other clients and to our current clients and help them on their journey more and more. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's really fun to hear kind of the, the big picture vision and everything. And, and um, I'm, I'm happy that you guys have gone this far and everything and, and continue to grow and kind of build the, build the company that you want. Because that's the American dream, right? To build, build what you want and kind of have the control over it to, to build some there, somewhere that's um, desirable for the people who want to come to, want to yeah. work and, and stick around. So Yeah, I mean, I think you and I are kindred spirits too. We've had a very similar journey and we're both entrepreneurs at heart. And yeah, that's a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to be able to do. Absolutely. The last thing, which I forgot to mention was, I know you guys got an event space as a part of your building, right? Is that in the same building or connected it is. somewhere else? Okay. Yeah, it is. So we have uh, the building that we're in, we have um, like the second floor is Blue Compass. And then right beneath it is a place called West 48 in West Des Moines. And it's an event space. So anyone can come rent it. So we have so many business functions there. Sometimes too, we'll do teaching and training and invite people to come do it. Um, it's a really awesome space. That's really cool. And I, I've, I've seen pictures online. It looks awesome. There's like customized lighting, right? And there's like screens on the wall and stuff it's, like that. It's super modern. Like if you're thinking about going to a, a hotel, you know, or something like that to go to one of their conference spaces, um, that's great. But this is a lot more modern, um, it has AV and stuff that doesn't fall apart. You have really great experts there. And yeah, it's really, really cool, really modern um, space. That's awesome. 
So wrapping it up here, um, you, we mentioned you have a book. Where can people find that? And then where can people learn more about Blue Compass if they want some marketing help? Yeah. So the book is called Retain. And the subtitle is How to Create an Incredible Company Culture That No One Wants to Leave. And you can get it on Amazon if you search for a Retain, you know, company culture book. Uh, or you can go to my website. It's drewharden.com, H-A-R-D-E-N. And then, yeah, Blue Compass is just at bluecompass.com and... I and Blue Compass are on like pretty much every social media and uh, it's pretty easy to find us out there. That's awesome. Well, Drew, thanks so much for being on the show. If you made it this far, make sure to give us a five-star review if you're listening on iTunes or Spotify and subscribe on YouTube for weekly episodes on business, finance, entrepreneurship, and marketing. My name is Ryan Snod. It rhymes a lot and we'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.